morning, everyone. It's great seeing you all. It's good to be back. I was speaking with Mary before, earlier, when we first got here, and I said, uh, with preaching, no tomatoes or stones today. Put them aside. Don't want to be cast upon there. I'd like to share a message today, Your First Love is the title. And uh, when I mentioned that to Maria, she said, you're not going to talk about an old girlfriend, are you? I said, no, I won't do that. But I want to talk about our first love. It's used the word love in so many ways, and then I think in the Greek term, is it five different meanings? How many? At least that. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, the thing about the Greek language is so descriptive and, de uh, and define the words. In America, you can say love, and well, what does it mean? I, I, I love chocolate, I love my wife, I love my car, I love uh, the Yankees. Are there any Boston fans here? Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I apologize. <laughs> but, but, so, but with the Greek, it's very descriptive and right to the point, and you know what type of love it is, uh, which I really enjoy that, that part. But Jesus said, greater love has no man than this, that he might, that one might lay down their life for another. And also, uh, at one point when, you know how the Sadducees and the Pharisees are always trying to chip up, trip up Jesus, uh, there was a lawyer that came across and, and said, well, Lord, what's the greatest commandment? And he said, well, to love your uh, God with all your soul, with all your might, and with all your mind. And that's the greatest commandment, isn't it? But he said, likewise, love your neighbor as thyself. Uh, Alan read the, the text today, Revelations 2, verses 1 through 7. Uh, but before we uh, get into the text, I'd like to just discuss, well, John. John was the inspired author, a uh, vessel by the Holy Spirit of, of putting uh, Revelation together. And Ephesus is the, the location where this took place as far as being addressed to the church in Ephesus. Ephesus was a, a commerce, one of the greatest commerce cities along the Mediterranean Sea. It's in modern day Turkey uh, today. Um, there was a lot going on there. There was the Temple of Diana, which was one of the great wonders, seven wonders of the world. But the, temp the Temple of Diana wasn't really a place of worship. They were the house of prostitutes and, and things like that. That was part of their worship. So it was kind of corrupt and morally corrupt. Uh, so it wasn't a really pleasant place. But it was a beautiful area. Uh, you can see the ruins now. Uh, the church is no longer there in Ephesus. Uh, but it was a beautiful place, an incredible place, and a lot going on there. Well, let's go to our, our text again. I'll review that again. <clears throat> now, Jesus wrote, there were seven letters uh, in, in the book of Revelation here uh, that John's talking about. Um, these letters address concerns, and then there's praise for what they're doing right. Uh, I believe there's only one letter there, or one note, that states that there was really nothing wrong. <laughs> they were doing everything right. But for the most part, there was something good and something that need to be, needed to be addressed. Uh, those letters are act actually applicable to today's churches. The, the, the concerns and the, and the praises, the good things, but we can actually take this and apply to the churches today. Uh, let's go to the book of Revelation, chapters, chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. This is the letter to the Ephesian church. <clears throat> to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, says this, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance, and that you cannot endure evil men, and you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not. And you found them to be false. And you, may, and you have perseverance, and have endured for my name's sake, and have not grown weary. Let's just stop there before we get into the other rest of the text. So far, it sounds like they're doing great, doesn't it? I mean, think about it. If someone came in here, Tom, uh, and the leaders of the body here, and they come in and start causing disruption amongst the church body. And all of a sudden, they're pulling people aside. Well, you know what? Uh, 
Jesus really didn't, wasn't raised from the dead, not bodily. You know, spiritually speaking, that could be the case, but no, he didn't really raise, was, wasn't raised from the dead. Or they might pull you aside and say, well, you can believe in Jesus and live any way you want, but you don't have to be baptized, you don't have to repent. That's just mumbo jumbo, that's not truth. The thing is you'd have to be addressed and that's what you'd have to do. And that's what they were doing. So they're doing everything right in those aspects. Now, let's, let's continue. But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember therefore from where you have fallen and repent and do the deed you did at first. Or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. What are some of the things that we can do today that can keep us from our first love? What are some things? Well, I made a list, but there's so, there's so many more, more things that we could do. Well, Jesus said in the book of Matthew, chapter 24, he was discussing the last days and when he would return. What are some of the signs? He said, well, uh, there'll be lawlessness that will increase and people's love will grow cold. People's love will be real cold. Have you seen that at all? I've seen it. I've seen it. But the good thing is that the, but the one who endures to the end shall be saved. And that's a positive. But some of the things that we can be concerned about or should worry about are worries and distractions of the world. Ephesus was a wealthy community. It was very busy. And as I mentioned, there was a lot of immoral activity there at the temple. Uh, if you look at the newspapers today, or read the news, or, or, or whatever it may be, watch TV, uh, the news stations, or podcasts, there's such turmoil in this world. And in communicating with a lot of my friends, Christian friends, this, this world is, is what, what is happening? It's insanity. It's getting crazier and crazier every day. I just flip on the news or read something or... Someone sends me something, I just, I just can't believe it. But God's in control, right? He's still on the throne. That's what we have to remember. And that's the encouraging thing. But it can be very discouraging. And I know a lot of people are getting depressed. And, and God, where are you? He's there. He hasn't left us. He's still there. But that can lead away, lead us away from Christ and his love and start looking and focusing on the world instead of focusing on him. You see, so the worries and distractions of the world are, you've heard of Corey Ten Boom before? Uh, I'm sorry? Corey Ten Boom? Oh, she was, she was a woman over in, uh, she was Dutch. And her family during World War II actually housed Jews. They were a Christian family and they took them in. And they must have saved, that they, they calculated about 800 lives. But apparently someone reported them and, and the Germans came in, took her, her, sis, her sister, uh, and her dad, the three of them, because her, her mom had passed away, but took them away to prison. At that time, the father passed away in prison. Then they, she was removed with her sister to a concentration camp. And then her sister passed away at the camp. But amazingly, they let her go eventually. That normally wouldn't be the case. You'd be put to death. But... But so that was her life, and she was a believer. She passed away many, many years ago, but she was a believer. She says, worry doesn't empty tomorrow of its sorrows. It empties, empties today of its strength. And when you think about that, what good does worrying do? What did Jesus say? It doesn't add a single cubit to your life. You're wasting your time. Focus on him, not on these distractions. And the parable of the seed, remember the parable of the seed in the book of Matthew? when the seed was sown amongst the rocks and amongst the thorns. And it basically said that the persecutions and the worries and deceitfulness of riches will lead us away from Christ and take us away. That's Satan at his work. He's busy. He wants us to see us, to see us leave the body of Christ. He wants to interfere with that relationship to create doubt and to plant that seed in there. So get rid of that seed of doubt because God's always there. Something else is busyness. Y'all busy? You busy sometimes? You busy? Q? Yeah, work, family, friends, everything's going on. My head spins sometimes, it gets so busy. You know, so much going on in life. 
and especially with a new grandchild, and we're expecting another one. Uh, but busyness can take us away from our focus on the Lord. And actually, think about this. Uh, this is important because you can be coming to worship every Sunday, every Sunday night, Wednesday night Bible study, involved in the church body, all the functions, but yet your relationship with Christ isn't there as it should be. You can even wear the Jesus I Love You t-shirt or Jesus Loves You t-shirt or on the bumper sticker, but it doesn't mean that your relationship with Christ is like this. It could be like this. That's the busyness of the world. You can be so involved. And I know as when I was preaching full time that there were times I was so busy with church activities <laughs> and with work and preparing the message and the Bible study. And then if there was a concern within the body of Christ and people were struggling, I had to be there for them. If someone passed away or someone was getting married, wait a minute, I need time to step back. Tom, <laughs> preachers know that. And, and people don't know unless you're truly in the ministry uh, of doing that work. But that busyness could be so, we can be so busy that it leaves you away, it leads you away a little bit from Christ. You can lose your focus. That, that sounds kind of crazy, but it's true. So all of us need to be aware of that. Jesus said in Revelation 3.16, I'd rather have you hot or cold, not lukewarm. Did you ever have lukewarm water on a hot day? Lukewarm tea? Not very good. You want to spit it out. And that's what Jesus said that he would do. I want you either hot on fire for me or cold, but not riding the fence. Like one foot out here in the world, one foot in the church body. I'd prefer to be on fire for Christ instead of supposed to being cold. But he said, I'd rather you be either be hot or cold. He said, I'll spit you out of my mouth if you're lukewarm. There's a story of a businessman that uh, he was so busy with his business and, and trying to be, uh, get more accounts and, uh, and get more money and for retirement and so busy and focused on that that he said, well, you know, when things slow down, when when I feel comfortable and secure, then I'll devote more time to my prayer life, to my scripture reading, to worship, and, and really getting out there and, and talking to people about Christ. Well, what happens when that man sort of dropped dead before that time? What was that time? It was a waste. A total waste of time. He wasted his life. Hold on, grasp that time we have with Christ now. We don't know what tomorrow may bring. What about sin? Can sin separate us from God? Well, the word says it does. Sin does separate us from God, regardless of the sin. Well, it was only a little, little white lie. It, didn't, it wasn't that bad. I just, well, yes, it is. There are no white lies. This, I was talking to someone the other day, and he's a preacher, really great guy. I love the guy so much. And he's talking about this individual came, a visitor that had tattoos all over his body. This happened, I guess, last week. And he was in a motorcycle gang. Well, he's no longer in the motorcycle gang, but he looks rough and tough, apparently. And a lot of the people in the body there are afraid of him. <laughs> Although he has turned away from his sin and wants to know more about Christ. See, sin and also being judgmental can what? Keep people out. I wasn't a real pleasant person. Well, people say I was, but I know I wasn't, <laughs> according to my father, our father in the scriptures, before I came to know Christ. The same with you. We have a past. Everyone here has a past. And I wrote back to my friend, sent him a text saying, gee, I guess he's joining the crowd. I, I know former murderers, adulterers, prostitutes, liars, thieves. The list goes on and on and on. And I am one of them or was one of them. And that's what we have to understand. 
to accept those people that are coming in without that. Take a look at the sin uh, in David's life. Did that separate him from God at all? From his first love from, from God? It did. His adulterous behavior, his murder, when he murdered, committed murder, and then taking a census of the people when he was told not to. And that cost thousands of people's lives. But David eventually repented. He realized when he was approached by Nathan that he had left his first love, his love for God. He was following the flesh, wasn't he? Which is very easy to do if we don't keep everything in check. And that's what we have to do. So sin can also separate us from our first love. The wonderful thing about Christ and our, our belief in Christ is uh, it's so different from any other religion. Uh, not only our first, first salvation and, and eternal life with him, but also our relationship with him. And this is the thing that we really need to focus on is, is that he loves us so much. And that relationship is crucial. He wants us to be intimate with him, to talk with him, to share our lives with him every moment. Well, gee, Lord, what if I'm struggling? Share your struggles. Say, Father, Lord, I, I am struggling right now. I need you. Help me to get through this. Don't let those struggles become a barrier between you and your first love. We can. It can happen very easily. The good thing is, and the good news is, that we can return to our first love. There are three things that we can do to restore that love relationship. And this is according to what the message here says. Number one is to remember. The Lord said to the church to remember. Do you remember the first time you received Christ. The first time you heard the gospel, the good news of saying, you can be forgiven. I don't care what you've done, it doesn't matter. God will forgive you if you come to him through Jesus Christ. Do you remember that? Is that how you were approached? Think about how you first became knowledgeable of the gospel. Did someone bring it to you? Did you read it? Did you see it, hear it on TV? That excitement. And so when we were baptized, we went under the water. I remember that first time coming up out. I, I felt so clean. Do you remember that? Do you still hold on to that? Do you still have that joy? Do you still have that peace? that relief of knowing that everything that you've done wrong is gone, that you are forgiven completely. From that point on, your past, present, and future sins, that's the beauty. You are forgiven. If we can go and confess again, right? We have to confess our sin and ask his forgiveness and turn from it. So we have to remember, we had a death sentence, everyone here, a death sentence like Corey Ten Boom at the concentration camps, all those people that were killed. Good old Hitler gave them a death sentence to put them all to death, the majority of those, those individuals. We had a death sentence because of our sin. It separated us from God. It separated us from God. But thankfully, we can come back. And that's number two. The Lord said to repent to turn away from sin and turn to him. So he was giving them another chance. Say, so listen, you did all these things right and that's wonderful, but you're messing up here. So before we, there's judgment, <laughs> repent. Turn away from those things that you're doing wrong. Come back to me and remember me. I'll forgive you and let's move on. And that's what we need to do. When we look at David's life in Psalm 51, um, it's, it's amazing. Uh, I'll, I'll go on to the next point in a second, but we need to, to do a, a self-examination sometimes, don't we? Lord, am I, am I living the life you want me to live? Am I pleasing you with my life? 
You call me to do this, I'm going to do it. You call me to do that, I'll do it. Lord, here I am. Something needs to be done. Lead me and guide me to it. I'm here. I'm your servant. And that's the attitude that we need to have. Repent. And number three is seeking the Lord. If we love our Lord above all things, as, we, as I mentioned before, if we seek God and love him with all of our heart, souls, might, and mind, we're going to be happy and treat our neighbors and love our neighbors as ourselves. We'll be happy people. But a lot of us don't do that, unfortunately. We have to seek those relationships and, and check our, wor our, our, our works, our attitudes. Uh, I, I, I preached, uh, I believe it was, it was last week on uh, another church body on Daniel in the lion's den. And uh, near the end, I, I just reflected on and spoke about there was this painting. You may have seen it. It's a beautiful painting. Uh, it shows Daniel in the lion's den. And he's here, and there's a bright light coming down like this at, at his back. There were hungry, roaring lions with their teeth open, their mouths open. You can see their teeth ready to jump into them. But they were lined up here. He's here. And he's focused on what? Is he focused on the lions, the distractions of the world? A death, possible death sentence here? Where is he focused? He's focused on the Lord. That's where it is. And that's what we all need to do with these distractions and all this going on in this crazy world. It's to focus on him, our Father, who will never leave us nor forsake us, regardless of what you're going through. There's a, a prayer that, uh, that was offered to the Lord. It, it's based on Psalm 51. And this says, Lord, create me a caring heart, tender toward the hurts and happenings of others, more concerned with their needs than my own. Create me an attentive heart, able to hear your whisper, and moment by moment to listen to your voice. Create me a contented heart at peace, with the circumstances of life. Create in me a hungry heart, longing to love you more, desiring your word, reaching, stretching for more of you. And you can't say it any better than David. <laughs> Lord, restore to me the joy of thy salvation. Do you still have that joy? Do you still have it? The word says if we draw near to him, he'll draw near to us. Christ loved us so much that he willingly suffered, was tortured, and died for us. But the good news is that he was resurrected. Our hope is in a risen Savior, not someone laying in the grave. And he's coming back. God loves you with an everlasting love. He says that you are the apple of his eye. Isn't that amazing? Think about that how intimate that is and he's speaking to you and he's speaking to me so have you left your first love have you I love this little it says how much does God love us and I remember seeing someone do this well it says Jesus stretched out his arms and said this much it is finished that's how much he loved us uh, that song that we sang, the first song that we sang, Heavenward, Heaven Came Down. I, that, was, that was like a perfect song. Heaven Came Down, and glory filled my soul. That's what we want to hear, that glory filled our, my, our souls. Um, <clears throat> have you received Christ? Have you been baptized? Have you heard the gospel? So when we first are introduced to the gospel, we come to a belief that Jesus Christ died for you. He died for me, for all. The Father doesn't want anyone to be lost, does he? That's what the word says, no one to be lost. So when we hear the gospel, someone has to speak at first, right? Remember that? When we hear the gospel, we come to a belief. We repent, we turn from our sins, or we come to a belief and then we confess that Jesus is Lord 
I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he died for me, and that he was resurrected from the dead. Now, it's not, we're not following a, uh, a certain protocol or creed. We're following the scriptures. It's exactly what it says. And so we confess that. We repent, we turn from our sin, don't we? After we confess that, which means turning away from it. And then in Acts 2.38, it says to what? Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's within us. When you're baptized, come up out of that water, we have God's Spirit within us. And then we live a life that's pleasing to the Lord. Does that mean we'll never fail? No. We will fail. But that's why we have Christ. We have the forgiveness of sins, 1 John 1, 9, right? If we go and confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen to that? Amen. If you'd like prayer today, if you need prayer, if you're struggling, we'd be happy to pray for you if you'd like to come forward. Or if you don't know Christ, please come forward today as we sing our song of invitation.